Your health is our priority. Each series, it's our goal to make sure that we provide you with experts and guests that offer multiple perspectives so that you feel supported, empowered, and less alone. Like the work we do? Buy us a cup of coffee. Or tea. You can leave us a tip over at coffee.com slash the hip podcast, which is ko-fi.com slash the HIP podcast, or with the link in our show notes. When you buy us a cup of coffee, you not only support the work we do, but also gain access to early releases and downloadable resources. Again, that's coffee.com slash the hip podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health It's Personal. Today, we had the wonderful privilege of sitting down with OBGYN, Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. She is not only a wonderful doctor who is really passionate about having open and honest conversations with her patients and kind of fighting stigmas within the medical industry, she also has a big following on social media where she shares myths, misconceptions, and answers all of our sexual health questions. She's really amazing and super easy to talk to, so we're so glad that we had the chance to ask her all of our burning questions. And my favorite part was that she was just so fun to talk to in general and made it such a breeze to talk about what many of us consider very awkward topics. (laughs) Yeah, why can't every doctor be like that? I don't understand. Like, can you Mm -hmm. not teach a class just about how to be... Because you know they're, for the most part, amazing humans, and they care about what they're doing, but that connection is so hard to find. For sure. I guess speaking of, you know, those connections that we have with, I guess, our medical professionals, have you, either of you, had that type of relationship with your doctors? Mom and I have a naturopath that we're very close to, but again, that's a doctor who's working a little bit outside of, you know, the traditional clinical doctor's office. My OB here in New York, she's in Brooklyn, so I haven't seen her in a while. But when I went to see my OB here in New York for the first time, I was having physical symptoms of anxiety, but I thought at the time I was having a heart problem or something. And actually, when I went to see her, I kind of told myself like, okay, this is probably just anxiety or mental or something or something you don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. But I still packed a bag for the hospital (laughs) in case she was like, you need to go to the hospital right now. (laughs) So that's how bad I was feeling. And I went to see her and she checked me out. And then she was like, all right. And she just looked in my eyes and was like, I think these are symptoms of anxiety even when I was looking down your throat, your tongue was shaking. Oh, <laughs> and I see you have your overnight bag. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And she was like, looked at, and my like legs were tapping, my knees were shaking, and I was just really tense. And so she actually sat there and walked me through some breath work. So she kind of like explained it to me anatomically, uh, validated my feelings, recognized that it was primarily a mental health issue, Mm -hmm. and then made sure I was seeing a therapist, sent me some videos of her favorite yoga instructor who does online videos. Wow. And said that if I ever wanted to come in for like a holistic evaluation, she is certified in this really particular branch of functional medicine that I could come in and do that too. So that was like above and beyond in my opinion. Yes. That's what we're needing. Yeah. Yeah. I I love that whole like Instead of just saying it's in your head, I mean, yes, it involves your your mind, but it also involves your body. It's all connected, which is so important. Well, I grew up in the military, so I kind of had all sorts of doctors and nurse practitioners over the years. So I never had one dedicated, you know, for more than a year or two um, doctor, which is, you know, a very different experience than many other people, I believe. And then I've also moved a lot as an adult, or I've tried different doctors once I stop going on base for medical care. And that's been a whole new journey because it's like a completely different world. And that's been stressful for me. I've had mostly bad experiences, to be honest. And like one doctor only wanted to talk about circumcision for some reason. I'm like, and I would only, I was only allowed to ask one question. I'm like, I'm here for five things. <laughs> but he'd he ask said me, you can only ask one question. No, he would. I was only able to get out one question. He'd oh. talk about like something weird like circumcision. And he'd be like, okay, I'll see you later. That like, wasn't oh. even related to you? <laughs> not at all. I was not there for sexual health or. <laughs> and he's like, have you ever considered adult circumcision? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he's like, you're circumcised, right? 
good because my son, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. Oh, um, he had hmm. like something he wanted to share. He just said, yeah, yeah, there was just, yeah, and that's just kind of how he was. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I went there a few times. I was like, you know, I'll go somewhere else. I went to this uh, LGBTQ friendly clinic in Phoenix with a doctor who wasn't actually very great, to be honest. He didn't care about much. He's really busy, like your dermatologist, like, yeah, okay, bye. But the nurse practitioner there sat down and listened to me for an hour and a half. I asked like 20 questions and it was the most amazing experience. And wow. I wish more experiences were like that, like yours, McKenna. Yeah. So it was so amazing. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I actually felt listened to. And that was wild. Yes. Well, and but we yeah, understand um, that the system's whack and that mm-hmm. it's hard for them to find time. Absolutely. But it, it, there has to be some sort of balance. Yeah, something. Yeah. And how about you, Kate? Yeah. So I've been really lucky um, having some amazing doctors throughout my 100 years. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I don't have anyone great here because I, I do move around a lot too. Mm-hmm. But what I did notice was when McKenna was small, we lived in the same place for a good chunk of time. And she, it was back, it felt like back in the day when you had a pediatrician, that pediatrician like really knew your kid. And, mm-hmm. you know, she would have McKenna like draw a picture when she would come in. And then the next time she came in, she'd have her draw another picture of herself. And like she'd keep them in a file. And these are, you know, McKenna's self portraits, like so just cool. like really amazing <laughs> person. And we loved her so much. But I don't feel like Max had that. Um, mm-hmm. In Verado, we, we had like a, I don't even know what that is. What is it where it's like a, like part of a hospital doctor's office. You know what I mean? And it's just mm-hmm. different people all the time. So not like a mm-hmm. really personal, true yeah. family, like had, yeah, community. Base, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly the same thing. So I, available. There's so <laughs> much value in that. And the fact that Dr. Lincoln just cares so much about her patients that she wants to kind of, like, what, did she call herself a social media doctor? Mm-hmm. I love yeah. I loved that because I remember Allie trying to like define what she was because she wanted to get that information out to people that couldn't didn't have the resources or the time mm-hmm. or the geography that th- they could come into her office, but that she could still help in some way like that kind of yeah. that kind of advocacy is just really incredible to me. I think yeah. it's really cool that they feel so compelled to make sure that every single person that needs this information gets it. For sure. Yeah. And then you can kind of be prepared for even if you weren't aware that those were things that you should be aware of. And so it's really cool to see that. Like I had a, for example, I didn't know men could get breast cancer until I had a scare when I was a teenager and there was a growth in in my chest. And it turns out- Yeah, it was very scary. And my mom was like, hold on, because my grandmother had breast cancer and things Mm -hmm. like that. And uh, so we're like, okay, so they at least knew what was going on, you know, or potentially. And so we got it checked out, went through all these examinations, and they determined that it was calcium. (laughs) It was just a calcium deposit. Right, which happens to women too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I was like, okay. But I didn't even realize, and I don't think a lot of, you know, men, especially young men, realize that. Mm. Same thing with UTI. I had a an STD scare where I went to the doctor. I'm like, there's, you know, my shame or my fear was like, oh my God, I have a, you know, whatever. And they did all the STD tests that they could order and uh, gave me antibiotics right then. They gave me the Z-Pack, went home. Turns out I was negative for everything and it probably was just a UTI. And, you know, that's not something I thought, you know, people with testicles got. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah, and one of the friends of the show actually wrote in that they really wanted us to address or one of the professionals to talk about UTI shame because there is so much shame associated with that because people think that it's strictly sexually, it's a sexual issue. Mm -hmm. And so you don't feel comfortable telling your parents because then they think you're sexually active or whatever, and then people aren't getting the care that they need. Which and is it, it crazy. could be connected, but it doesn't mean it's always connected. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there absolutely. are other causes. <laughs> we covered a lot of topics today, but Dr. Lincoln's so great at talking about them that we were able just to have a really authentic conversation with her and learned a lot, as we always do. So everyone, please grab a cup of tea and enjoy. Health is harmony. When you're aligned to everything you believe in is when you feel that harmony and you feel peace. Trying to get to the root cause of things. That is just so much to learn. Can you be present in those moments in your life that mean the most? Because health, it's personal.
Hey, Dr. Lincoln, we're so thankful to get to chat with you today as your knowledge and advice about our bodies and sexual health is incredibly helpful. The human body is complicated enough as is, but then we have all of these cultural and societal concerns to keep in mind as well. And our body image shame, male, female bodies and gender identity are all important conversations that we need to get better at having. And you're obviously amazing at this. But before we dive into the conversation, would you mind telling our listeners about yourself, what you do, and how you're working so hard to educate people about these topics? Sure. And thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited. I could talk about this stuff all day. And I guess I kind of do, but (laughs) I can and do. I can and do. (laughs) So um, I'm an OBGYN and a board certified OBGYN, and I currently practice as an OB hospitalist. So I focus my care, uh, pregnant and postpartum people either for birth or for, you know, in the hospital for other issues, not related to obstetric issues. And it's super fun. I'm also an IBCLC or an international board certified lactation consultant. And I'm, I'm like a social media doctor now too. So I talk about topics on social media, educate. I wrote a book about these topics and I just find that I love helping people understand their bodies, breaking down the shame that our culture just loves to heave upon us. And I learned a lot in, along the way too. Lots mm-hmm. of stuff's out there that I had no idea people were thinking. And here we are today. So yeah, to I, you learn so much in your your medical education. But I imagine that you don't stop sometimes to think about some of the topics. And we've actually been going through your book all week for the last few weeks, actually. But as we've been preparing for this interview, I'll just throw out like, "Hey, what about this? What about this?" And so I just <laughs> yeah. keep going through. I love how it's so that we could actually answer one of these questions for ourselves in like three seconds. So just I like that you can flip through it instead of read it from beginning to end or how however you want to, but it's a really cool book. Thank you. Yep. With the TikTok generation, and I'm not making fun of the TikTok generation because now I'm part of that world. And so, (laughs) you know, you get a couple seconds to capture people. And I, you know, I feel that sometimes we overcomplicate it. If you can explain something simply, we should just do that and then we can move on. And yeah, I think it's great because you can just kind of pick it up and, and move through it or go to a particular section. So it was super fun to write (laughs) the research. Let me just tell you my browser history. Very interesting. (laughs) Writing this book. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, And it continues to be. Yeah. My two kids sometimes look at my computer and they're just like, what's that mom? I said, it's for work. And it is. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you mind telling us how old your kids are? Yeah. I have two boys ages 11 and six and they are, I find it hilarious. They're surrounded by, you can see my office. There's models of the pelvis. There's uterus art. There's a clitoris and to them, it's just normal. So I have a lot of hope for them that they'll, they'll be pretty, you know, educated and, and with it when they get older. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Could you raise all of our boys, please? I, you know what? I will, because I feel like I'm terrified of raising girls. I think that my, you know, the sperm and eggs, they knew like I could only have boys, which is funny as a gynecologist. I just feel like I could mess up a girl so much. And maybe that's why I project all of this education onto other people thinking here, let me help you because, <laughs> because I don't know, what do, yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's great. It's I, uh, I love the title of your book too. And mom and I have always talked about writing a book about mental health and your sexual health and calling it upstairs, downstairs. Yes. <laughs> They're so linked, right? They're absolutely what, what goes, you know, what happens up there affects down there. Yeah. I had one person ask me once, they said, Jen, why did you name it? Let's talk about down there because you're such a fan of using real terms and, you know, staying away from all the silly euphemisms that we use. Mm -hmm. But my goal was to, you know, like you see it on a bookshelf and be like, okay, I can pick that up. Because if I said, let's talk about your vulva, vagina, clitoris, scrotum, testicles, like whatever people would be like, no, thank you. Um, And then you open it up and you're like, okay. (laughs) But it it kind of hooks you in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We just learned recently people call their, I guess, vagina, like their cookie or something like that. (laughs) That was one term. Let me tell you, I didn't know until I was an intern. I had a patient. She kept referring to her kitty and I thought we were talking about a cat. (laughs) And it wasn't until she kept pointing and I was like, why are you coming to me? to talk about this. And then I'm not a veterinarian. I am not a veterinarian. And then since then, oh my goodness, the floodgates have opened. Yeah. Cookie kitty. Those are two of the more common ones. And I'm just thinking, you know, vagina is honestly easier to say, like, why are we calling it? You know, I mean, I laugh, I say hoo-ha because I find that word hilarious and we can't use these words, but 
Yeah. When an adult is, doesn't feel comfortable to say these words. And I think we're talking about an animal. Like we have gone off the rails. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> a pet name. It gives it a whole nother. Exactly. Name. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Well, I guess on that note, we can kind of shift into body image because that's a mm -hmm. huge, I mean, that's part of it, right? We're all yeah. so self-conscious about that body image and our body parts. Could you kind of give us a little bit of background on what that looks like for us? The typical yes. human? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the, the typical human feels terrible about their body because when is the last time you saw somebody or maybe you yourself woke up and said, oh, God, I look good, right? We all go, I'm mm. so tired. My skin is sagging. You know, I've got these extra pounds and whatever. And it's a lot of it is this is what happens in a, an era, especially right now with social media where everything is photoshopped and there's a filter. And I'm not saying you can't use these, but these affect how we look at ourselves. And we're in a culture where especially for women and vagina owners. And, and, you know, we're told that we're supposed to not be sexy when we're younger, right? Because mm -hmm. then you're just a slut, but then you should be a sex kitten as soon as you're married and know everything, even though we never got taught it. And mm -hmm. your breasts are amazing and sexual, but don't show them when you're breastfeeding and have <laughs> babies. Cause that's the whole reason you exist, but you better bounce back in four weeks. Like, Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's no wonder we're all screwed up. Um, and it's so sad, you know, people, struggle so much. And I'm not saying I'm immune to that. We all do that, but right. if anything, especially, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, like the labia, mm. what a landmine for body image issues. And it's just so sad to see what this does to people and the real estate it takes up in their, in their mind. Yeah, no, I want to talk about that now mm -hmm. because you wrote about that in your book as well. And I hadn't really considered that. I must be proud of mine. Yay! Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you think of body image about like weight or the way that you look, but the things that are covered up, you know, I know I have some friends who don't feel comfortable with the way their breasts look or mm -hmm. things like that. And so as a OBGYN, those are probably the things that you focus on most mm -hmm. when you talk to people about how they feel about themselves. What things that are that other people don't see are we also internalizing? Yeah, there is so much labial shame. And I've had patients who've said, you know, that they've wanted labiaplasties, which is a surgery to mm -hmm. modify the appearance of a labia. And usually it's making them smaller because if you look at what is typically put out there in the porn industry, it's and, and it's weird to even like say these words out loud, right? It's small labia that tend to be innies and not outies. And if this is the first time you're even hearing of that terminology, like welcome to the party that I you know, was on TikTok all the time. So then maybe you, you know, have an innie, right? Maybe you have an innie or an outie and, you yeah. know, and, and the idea that the labia minora, the inner lips protrude out, that's called an outie or they're tucked in and that's considered an innie. And in the porn industry, what you tend to see are these cute little innies that have no hair, of course. And so people think that's the norm and they think that's what's desirable. Mm. So yeah, I've had patients who felt really embarrassed and not to say that there aren't reasons that labiaplasty is indicated. For example, if the labia are large enough that they're getting caught in clothes or on bicycles or, you know, causing, causing pain, that's for sure an issue. But there are people who have said um, there was actually a plastic, a cosmetic surgeon on TikTok who used a roast beef sandwich to demonstrate this and to say like she could do labiaplasties and make people feel good and what and it drove me nuts yeah <laughs> do you remember oh seeing it it was goodness. about a year ago maybe um yeah and I tried to forget <laughs> yeah you tried to forget and I'm sorry I brought it back for you yeah so the <laughs> idea that they should look cute and little and really what they're going for is this prepubescent look because we have fetishized fetishized that's a hard word we have made it a fetish you know the hairless vulva, the tucked in tiny vulva. It's sort of this weird obsession with the, you know, the barely 18 crowd. And it's heartbreaking to see people who walk around feeling so gross, or they've had a partner tell them that their labia are weird. Or I've had a lot of people who've asked about whitening because that area can get darker mm -hmm. and that's normal. It's hormones, but people want that, want it to be lighter, which has its own sort of racial undertones of what we think mm -hmm. lighter being better. There's just, you know, we've got enough stuff to worry about, right? And then to worry, that, you know, and it's, and sometimes it's because they've seen it or it's a partner who's really made them feel really bad about themselves. Yeah, I absolutely. So. I was thinking about how the trend has gone towards being hairless mm -hmm. and how that's considered more attractive. And there's a lot of shame associated with that. And I think for young people in particular, it can be really confusing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And I tell people there's no shame. Like if you want to remove your pubic hair, yeah, whatever, like do it. It's totally fine. Do, for you. do it if you want. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Do it if you want to. And pubic hair does have a purpose. Will you die without pubic hair? No, but it, there is a reason that it's there, but only remove it if you want to. And I think what really bothers me is when I see healthcare providers make fun or shame people. And I just saw a post of this yesterday on a nurse's Instagram And uh, she was posting a comment that she had had a student who'd said that somebody she was working with said, oh, my God, you know, now it's gone the other way where now people aren't trimming enough and don't let it be a jungle and Mm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking you're a healthcare provider. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) It is to people. So, yeah, it's just. I'm just going to ask, what is the purpose of pubic hair? Thank you for asking. I could talk about that all day, too. Um, So it it reduces. (laughs) You'd be really fun at a party. (laughs) I, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> say I haven't done that before. It reduces friction. That's a really big one. So between the sensitive vulvar skin and your clothes, it can help be a little bit of a barrier. It also helps to mm. catch any bacteria so that they don't tend to have an easy entrance up into the vagina. So it decreases your risk of infections. And it also helps to prevent or um, make a little bit of natural moisture to help keep the pH and sort of the humidity of the area where it's supposed to be. So Pubic hair. Yeah. yeah. So people without pubic hair can get one of those, like you get a humidifier for like your <laughs> Okay, so that's a thing. It's called no. yoni. Yeah, I know. It's called yoni steaming. And actually uh-huh. it's related to, yeah, it's this practice where you put these herbs and water in a bowl and it's steaming and you sit on top of it. And it's supposed to steam your yoni, which is a word for like your vagina uterine environment. And hmm. The idea is that it helps to like rebalance your hormones and it will make you fertile and it cleanses and detoxes the uterus and the vagina. You might be surprised, but none of these are true. (laughs) And it's, yeah, it's crazy. And there've also been reports of people like burning their vulvas from it. So Mm -hmm. it's not not good. (laughs) Well, and there are obviously some things that we've seen on social media from healthcare providers that have been not so helpful and also from, Mm -hmm. you know, influencers and people who maybe are taking advice from people who aren't accredited or giving out the right healthy information. But you have a very large presence on social media and are offering really wonderful information. How has that experience been for you? Oh, thank you. It's super fun. It's also really frustrating sometimes because just like you said, there are people out there who have really large followings and they have no credentials or expertise in the area. And a lot of them, I'm thinking of the the self-proclaimed hormone experts, birth control experts. And and when you dive into their bios, you find out that they're a chiropractor or that they have no Mm -hmm. training at all. And, but what they are doing is they're selling you products. And so you know, I put this in my book and on my social media all the time that you have to really first stop and say, who is this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are they an expert? And what are they trying to get out of this? And what's sad is that viral misinformation goes, you know, misinformation in general, it goes viral much more quickly than legit information. So sometimes I feel like there's this waterfall and I'm just like trying to plug the little holes and it'll never end. But, but, you know, we get there. And one of it, one of the purposes that I really love about using social media is to help people just know how to consume it. And so they feel more health literate and can themselves be like, no, no, that's not true. I'm not going to listen to that. And then the, what really bothers me are the people who are the, what we'd say, the experts. They are physicians. They are, you know, in healthcare and they're spouting this garbage. And they're people who have kind of gone off the bandwagon. And we see this a lot with the COVID pandemic, right? You know, mm-hmm. physicians, but they're totally not, not at all, you know, following any sort of ethical guidelines or evidence-based guidelines. And they are using their platforms for harm. And, you know, Facebook and Instagram, they need to do better with moderating this stuff. They're terrible at it. And TikTok too. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, are, so are you feeling really connected to your audience? And do you get a lot of questions that you're able to answer and have some great success stories? I do. And I actually have a folder that I save on my desktop. It's called nice comments. There's yeah. one next to it called, you know, terrible comments. And I do save those because when I give <laughs> talks about social media and medicine, I like to present a balanced view that, you know, sometimes you're going to get the trolls and some of them are just so bad. They're they're hilarious. And they yeah. <laughs> yes, I do feel very connected. I get wonderful feedback. And not it's not always like, thanks, Dr. Lincoln, you're so great. Some of the feedback is, hey, you said this, and I don't think you got it right. Or you use this term and you should have said this. And I really appreciate when people come at it 
from a place of like trying to help me to do better. And I learn, I feel like I've learned a ton from my audience, but I've gotten some amazing stories of people who have said that they were able to advocate for themselves because of something they saw on my platform. And I love that because these are people I've never met and never, ever, ever will social media replace what you have, you know, that personal relationship with your healthcare provider. But it's so cool to think that we can help people that we never met. And I'm hoping to be a small part of the undoing of the trauma that is what a lot of this shame-based purity culture education has done to a lot of us, myself included. Right. So it's nice to feel like you're somewhat hoping to move the needle a little. Yeah. It's so fun. And yeah. not everyone has a strong relationship to their healthcare provider, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And they don't have access, right? Um, Or they don't feel that they can speak up. So yeah, sometimes my DMs are hilarious. And sometimes they're filled with people who want to know if they're pregnant. I'm like, I cannot diagnose that. (laughs) Just send me a picture of the test. (laughs) Oh, they want to. Oh my gosh, they do. I'm like, nope, nope, I cannot. No, 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 no. Like, you know, now it's like the COVID rapid test is like the new pregnancy test. Like, is it, isn't it? I'm like, I don't know. Talk to your doctor. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's funny. Well, people do feel desperate. So McKenna and I are super into making sure that we have the right people guiding us through things that we don't know about. We want experts, good people that care about, but my son could care less about seeing a doctor ever. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I've tried really hard to find him people that he can connect with, but he hasn't had like one person throughout the time. And I think that can be really hard for people to find if they're not, it's a lot of work. So if you don't know where to look or how don't have the time to do that work, it's hard to find Mm -hmm. someone that cares for you. Oh, it's damn near impossible. And so I'm in this world, right? And not only am I a physician, but I work in a city where I trained here. I know so many physicians and you know so many people. And even for me to figure out who I wanted as my PCP, it took some trial and error. And it is so hard to know who is up to date or who has a bedside manner, who will make the time. It can be really hard. And I just, I tell people we have the greatest healthcare system in the country in theory, but it's terrible. We don't have access. We don't emphasize communication. I mean, I had to take physics to get into med school, which is useless, right? Mm -hmm. But it would have been nice to like screened out the people who didn't know how to talk to other people who were different than them or have respect. (laughs) That's a great point. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No. I know I went to the doctor the other day and she's like, you have skin cancer. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just gotta go. Be right back. You know? I was like, thanks. Mm. She goes, I'm just going to freeze it off real quick. Take this cream. Bye. <laughs> yeah. I was like, um, okay. <sighs> and she's a dermatologist and she makes a ton of money too. And you're like, yeah. oh, why? <laughs> yeah, that's why. Because she's like, right. boom, boom, exactly. boom, boom. Yeah. She probably sees Aww. 800 patients a day. Oh, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, I love it. Sorry. Oh. One mole at a time. Yes. Right? <laughs> One Dr. Pimple Popper at a time. <laughs> well, in your book, you answer all kinds of questions that many people feel embarrassed asking. Could you give us some examples of questions that you've gotten mm-hmm. that are yeah. a little bit outside the norm that we might not think maybe we don't even ask ourselves? Oh, yeah. I get a lot of questions to sort of, you know, piggyback on the, am I pregnant? I get very specific Mm. timelines of when people had sex, where the semen landed, how much there was, when the plan B was ingested. And people really want to know, like, is it going to work or isn't it? And it's so hard to, now that I know what your night was like, you know, from start to finish, which (laughs) is awesome that you felt you could share with me. I cannot tell you if you're, you're going to get pregnant or not, but here you did the best you could. So here we go. I'd say a lot of questions I get to are people just don't understand their anatomy, especially when it comes to people with vaginas, because it's not like, you know, a lot of people have never looked. So they'll say there's this, I I feel this bump, but I'm too scared to look, or I found this thing, but I don't know how long it's been there. And I really encourage people to take a mirror and to take a look. And just like you, you know, you keep on everything else, just occasionally check in and people, you know, are just so afraid. One thing that I get all the time, especially from younger people is I think I have an infection and they're talking like a yeast infection or a bladder infection, but they follow that up with, but I can't tell my mom because she'll yell at me. And so I can't, Hmm. I can't go to the doctor and I try to like figure out, do you think that this means if you have a bladder infection, you've had sex or your mom's going to think that, or like, you know, what have you Hmm. heard? Why do you think that she's going to yell at you for like you being worried that you've got some itching? So many people are so afraid to talk to their parents. So as a parent myself, you just try to be that open space. Like nothing you ever tell me is going to, you know, change how I feel. And 
you just, and then these problems, you know, they're like, well, then I tried Vagisil and Summer's Eve and this didn't work. And I'm like, no, stop. Summer's Eve. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm so glad that you brought that up because actually one of our listeners asked us to talk about UTI shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, especially I think when it's related to sex too, Mm -hmm. people feel like, well, I get a bladder infection after sex and what does that mean? And yeah. And I think there's so much, you know, misinformation about that because especially about any kind of recurrent infection, yeast, UTI, BV, people say, well, it just keeps coming back. I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking, have you talked to your healthcare provider? And they say, yes. And like we have protocols for suppression. Like, why are they not helping you with this? Like you can prove, you know, you can suppress it and prevent another one or you can find it on the CDC website. So sometimes it just bothers me that I feel like people are just like you said, like, oh, you're, you have UTI. Okay. Bye. I gotta go. Like, whoa, whoa. Like yeah. let's take some history here, you know? Yeah. 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 Have you noticed that you have much of a male following because young men can be especially at risk of a lack of knowledge because they're Mm -hmm. often less likely to seek out answers sometimes, you know, because if they're trying to hold up some sort of like image of strength, but have you experienced some, a male following in that way? Yeah. So my male following has increased recently, which I love. It's still about 85% of people who identify as female, but there are definitely some guys and it's kind of funny to watch them like stumble into my content. So if a TikTok is going viral and ends up on the for you page and then they comment and they're like, why am I here? And I was like, well, now you're going to stay here because you commented. So TikTok thinks that you want to see this. So yeah. welcome and you know, pull up a chair. <laughs> um, and some of them are like, ah, while others are really excited. Um, I actually had somebody comment this morning. I did a YouTube that went viral about masturbation. And this one lovely gentleman wrote back and said, I just want you to know my girlfriend is very happy because of you, (laughs) (laughs) because I used your techniques and, you know, and I thought, yay, I'm so glad. Tell her I said, hi, you know, like, that's um, so funny. Do you mind if we talk a bit about masturbation? Oh, yes. No, of course we can talk about that. But, um, but no, I'd love to, but yeah, so I'm super happy. I think Guys, especially they're ignored, um, you know, in those teen years, I feel like they get the basics like use a condom and, but there, yeah. there isn't that impetus to link them to healthcare, like pap smears, birth control, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. So they do get lost in the shuffle and there's very gendered ideas of, of what they're supposed to ask about and what they're not. And so a lot of them aren't getting their questions answered except for on social media. And sometimes they find a good masturbation YouTube video and sometimes they find garbage. So, you know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows what's out there? <laughs> Maybe we need to teach our boys how to find a good masturbation video. <laughs> yeah, there you go. yeah. And yeah. So like I talk, I get questions like I found my child touching themselves. I'm like, cool. That's, you know, that's great. Like it's the safest sex they'll ever have. Just give them guidelines, you know, in your room, wash your hands. Like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. And I was yeah. just thinking like you get a physical and the doctor will just, you know, check your testicles and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, like three seconds late, that's about all you get. <laughs> like you said, right, not much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no and it's so and... variable. So I am married to a pediatrician and he's now an honorary gynecologist because of me. And mm-hmm. it's, it's adorable to watch him get so excited about it. He's like, I told her not to use Vagisil, Jen. I'm like, Yay. <laughs> um, and I feel like we're getting there, but he is so good with his teenage patients. And I think because he's, see, you know, he's sitting next to me at the desk and seeing what I'm hearing. And, mm-hmm. and he will say, so what have you heard about this? What have you heard about gonorrhea? How do you know you're ready to have sex? And I'm just tearing up. I'm like, you're the doctor they all need. <laughs> you know? oh, that makes that. me yeah. so happy. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's the exception, right? Like it's not standard. And, that, and this is why we need people to go into the field who know they can talk about this and they should be talking about mm-hmm. it. And it's all about prevention instead of undoing all these terrible ideas when they're in their thirties and they don't know what to, who to talk to. You know? <laughs> Hello. Mm-hmm. 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 Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Might be why we're doing this series. <laughs> it's all good. You know, it's all right. It's over here. <laughs> and I was like, usually you get like, do you have any questions? I'm like, a lot, but also none. <laughs> and right. I will never yes. ask you. <laughs> right. right. So many, but not for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. When we first started the Health It's Personal podcast, we were a little overwhelmed and had no idea how we might get our episodes out there. But with Anchor, it solved a bunch of our concerns all in one space. Anchor has been really great when it comes to navigating the site and sharing our work with others. It's easy to embed on our website, to share on social media, and works perfectly for us every time. 
From the production standpoint, uploading an episode each week, especially in the beginning, can be confusing and takes a lot of energy to get it just right. So I love that I can easily upload, edit, and track each episode hassle-free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. But of course, if you prefer to use another trusted editing software, Anchor is perfect for managing episodes, updating show notes, inputting ads, and feeling confident that your progress is safely saved and shared. Anchor distributes your content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. We've had so much fun making this podcast, gained priceless information, and made lifelong friends. We always like to encourage others to use their voice to speak about their passions and help others. If you have something you'd like to share, Anchor is a great place to start. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm. That's A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M to get started. We had a urologist, Dr. Justin Human, on recently who spoke about Mm -hmm. men's health and how when he sits down with a patient who's maybe having erectile dysfunction, he looks at it holistically and is like, okay, well, this is a sign of something. Like, let's talk about your lifestyle and and figure out what's going on. And when it comes to those kind of outside the gender binary, what are some misconceptions that folks should keep in mind or some things that maybe you've seen? Yeah, I think that is so great to hit on that because that's something that I am very passionate about. Um, because when people come into, you know, when you think about an OBGYN's office, think about the imagery, the language, the intake forms, it's geared towards cisgendered straight women. We do not do a good job of reaching out to people who do not fit into that binary. And it does a huge disservice. And we know that people who are trans or non binary, I was actually just reviewing these statistics this morning because I got into somewhat of an argument with an OBGYN online about mm. why it's okay to say pregnant people and not pregnant women and, and what this means. And, oh boy, yeah. um, <laughs> but we know that they do not seek out healthcare as much. They have higher rates of suicide when they are, um, affirm pronouns are not listened to. And especially in very gendered offices like the OBGYNs, they might not want, you know, uh, somebody who is a trans man does not want to come in for pap smear screening into the center for women's health. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you make your office feel like a safe space for all, you know, a trans man could get pregnant, right. If they have a uterus. And so what, how does that look? And I was some of the biggest pushback and the most angry people I get on social media are people who really hate when I use inclusive language. And I think this, like out of everything that's happening in the world right now, this is what you're angry about. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and that's they're like, you're you know erasing you're doing women. Good. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. Exactly. I was like, okay, well, this is where we need to be for a while. Because mm-hmm. yeah. they say you're erasing women. I was like, no, no, we're just adding to the definition. And that doesn't take away your, like I identify as a woman and that's what, you know, but mm-hmm. me, I should not assume that. So it's very interesting. And some of the content that I've made about that has gotten me the most trolls and the most, you know, whatever. But it's also gotten me the comments from people who are like, thank you. Like, I have never had somebody address me this way or knowing that there are people out there like you. And I think it's changing. I think we're, we're getting there, mm-hmm. but not anywhere where we should be. Right. And it does nothing. Yeah. This doctor I was talking to is like, well, grammatically, it's not correct. And he's like, oh, stop it. You just used a whole bunch of words in your thing. You misspelled them. You don't care about grammar. Like, don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, you like, don't even like make the, sense. Yeah, no. right. Like with a uh, mixed Darren on Instagram and TikTok, they just said, you know, why are you worried about grammar and sports? Why are those the things that you care <laughs> suddenly care about rather than all, all of a sudden? <laughs> yeah, instead of treating people like humans, like <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I know, I know. And and he was an OBGYN, and he said, you know, I'm older, and so I'm not used to this. And they said, with all due respect, in our field, we're known for adapting extremely quickly in situations where an emergency C-section is needed or we need to do something. I was like, people in our field are very good at making very quick changes and not, you know, getting obsessed with like, oh, well, it wasn't this way five minutes ago. Like, move on, sir. You're going to be okay. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> oh. You'll recover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but your patients might not. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs> All good. All good. <laughs> For people who don't feel necessarily comfortable walking into a women's, you know, focused OBGYN, are there other mm-hmm. places that they could go where they might feel more comfortable? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I I talk about and I've talked about in my social media that you know we do not hold the keys on Pap smears. That a lot of internal medicine physicians, family physicians, are great for this because they care for everybody. So when it comes to cervical cancer screening, chest or breast screening, mammograms, you don't need to have an OBGYN. And you know depending where you are, there are centers for trans people or non-binary people. So I'm in Portland, Oregon, and OHSU has just opened up one such center, which I think is great because I was referencing, you know, where I trained, it was a center for women's health. And as you can imagine, that's pretty, very defined. And so they have a a separate center that is, you know, for hormone treatment and consultations and a full wraparound care, and also the routine primary care stuff like cervical cancer screening and all that kind of stuff. And I love that, but I really think this is where going to a family medicine doc or internal medicine doc. PA, nurse practitioner, they're a great resource and you can walk into an office and you can sit in a waiting room and see people who look like you. And that's really great. <laughs> yeah, that is that's you know. really great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Sort of a follow-up question to all of that, but for like cis men, I think there's a lot of stuff that they might not realize is still relevant to them. They might think, oh, that only happens to women. For example, um, men can still get breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Men can get UTIs. Yeah. Are there any other, or could you tell us a little bit more about that side of things? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So when it comes to, you know, breast cancer screening, think about what the typical breast cancer, like mammogram suite looks like, right. And it's all the pink ribbons and the, it's very gendered. Mm-hmm. Like you said, with UTIs, or what about libido issues, right? We think of low libido as like a female only problem. Mm-hmm. You know, we've all like, like you were bringing up McKenna, like the erectile dysfunction like we do tend to talk about that more, right? Viagra can be on a commercial. That's okay. That's mail order because it has to do with guys, not birth control because that's dirty, but let's get those penises erect, right? <laughs> we could talk about that, but we don't talk about libido, depression, mental health. I talk about postpartum depression and anxiety. And when I'm rounding on a patient in the hospital, I say for, you know, for moms and for dads, like this affects you too. And it's not weak if you're struggling and, and to reach out. Mental health is a huge gap, especially for right. the, you know, traditional cis man who's so strong, like a bull, and, you know, <laughs> and like, come on, that didn't work out. You know, people say, well, in, in other generations, and it's like, no, they just committed suicide and they just ended up yeah. in jail and they just like beat up their kids. It wasn't yeah. better in yeah. the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's a great point. And what about uh birth control? Yes. <laughs> Men need to pay attention to birth control as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I often get on my social media is women who are very angry and they're like what about men and their birth control options? I'm like I hear you. Yes, I hear you, but you know, it's really it's different in terms of, you know, stopping millions of sperm versus one ovulation event a month. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying we we do need male birth control and it is in the works, but it's different in terms of tolerating side effects when the, you know, comparing that to a risk of pregnancy versus somebody where there is, the risk is, is nothing because the baseline, they wouldn't use anything, but yes, mm-hmm. there's a big myth going on in, in TikTok about how vasectomies are reversible. And I don't know if you talked about this with a urologist too is on, but they should not be treated that way. Like, hello, like yeah. you're literally, it's called a permanent form of birth control. Not that you can't attempt a reversal, but they're not always successful. They're not always covered by insurance, but the idea like, well, men should just get snipped and, and not subject us to the side effects of birth control. I'm like, whoa, whoa please slow down. <laughs> hold on. Like, Too far the other the, direction. <laughs> yeah. Like there's, yeah. There's the middle ground. <laughs> and yeah. while men need to be aware and understand what their responsibility is, the ultimate onus is on the women because- you know, they're ultimately the ones whose bodies are affected by a pregnancy. And, you know, there's other emotional things that both people mm-hmm. deal with, but we mm-hmm. have to protect ourselves because if we don't, no one else will, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We can't just rely. And I think it's, right. You can't rely on somebody else, but I think it's great for men to, to at least understand how birth control works. Side Absolutely. effects, Like it's great you know, the partner, they're like, well, I don't know. She said she's on the pill, which is a real bitch. I'm like, no, (laughs) (laughs) hold on. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it it takes two to tango. So it's, if you you can't take the pill or have the IUD, like what can you do? Right. You can prevent STIs. You can make sure that your partner has access to what they need. And Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like uh, my sister-in-law can't take birth control because Mm -hmm. it really impacts her too severely. So Mm -hmm. my brother is, you know, they figured other ways out to <laughs> right right yeah. yeah exactly yeah totally and that's so helpful mm-hmm. and dr human did 
he go we went into great detail on how that works, the vasectomies and everything. So that was very enlightening because there is that myth going around mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. 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 Vasectomies are so satisfying. Like, again, I went into a whole field to not have to work with penises, but <laughs> I do wish that I had more training because they're so low risk. They're so quick. They're so low mm-hmm. cost. And they're just so cool. <laughs> Did you say I satisfying? Say they are. Cause it's just like you walked in and then you walked in. It's just so, I don't know. It's Got just, it. Like, yeah. 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 like exactly. <laughs> it's also a little funny how scared men are of them. Right. You know, like as you're like, you know, I was in a, you know, when you're in a delivery and somebody's been pushing for hours and hours. And I was like, remember how you said you were scared of a vasectomy and it was going to hurt? Like <laughs> now you say nothing yeah, <laughs> right. ever yeah. again. We had a yeah. family friend who was on the couch for like a week with frozen peas. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like I'm dying, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you're the a hero, cult. you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And um, the vasectomy myth is definitely interesting. I was at a women's march, maybe like, I think it was like a few months ago or six months ago. And there was this guy wearing a Harley Davidson t-shirt and he was there with his girlfriend. He was very just like, Mm -hmm. you know, like masculine looking. Yeah. And his sign said something about this wouldn't be a problem if men just got vasectomies or something. And um, yeah, you're like, (laughs) Yeah. And that was his and it was funny because I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, yeah, he was holding the sign. Or maybe it might have even said like vasectomies or reverse it was like something like that. And I was like, that's great. But also I'm interested into what that really means. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. You're like, we 18 year olds can't just all get vasectomies and then, you know, when they're 35, we're like, well, no, you know. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> a little off base, but he had the spirit. Right. Was like, Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know if he had a vasectomy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's hilarious. So while we're on the <laughs> on this <laughs> topic, I guess, would you mind if I asked a little bit about maybe your thoughts on circumcision and yeah. the shame and body image issues with that as well? Yes. So let's talk about the circumcision community. They are very outspoken, the anti-circumcision community. And I bring that up because, you know, they, they're outside the American College of OBGYN meetings. Some of them have come after me in my DMs and whatnot. And I always want to be like, I agree with you. Yeah. I was trained to do them and I think they're horrible and I've stopped doing them. And I do not think that we should be doing cosmetic surgery on newborns. And, oh, I totally agree with what they're saying. And I think they're shooting themselves in the foot because I get why they're angry and, I, you know. But um, the activism community, it's a tough one to crack through. So no, I mean, I was trained as an OBGYN in residency. And it's weird, depending on what hospital you're in, what part of the country OBGYNs will do them or the pediatricians will do them. It's like, mm. you know, it just depends. And, you know, in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, it was kind of a, you know, we all did them. And again, one of the a weirdly satisfying, like, so <laughs> like, it's just like you pop it. Very weirdly satisfying. And also I hated every moment of it because there's this like adorable newborn and you know, and, and people who are pro circumcision and whatever, again, I don't know. Actually, I do. I have a lot of opinions about circumcision. <laughs> you know, the reasons they say that you should have them done, like to decrease infection, to decrease HIV infection and HP, whatever, all this stuff, UTIs. And I'm like, you guys, it's a weird surgery to be offering to everybody to prevent a very tiny thing that's also very easily treatable. And I can think of really other great ways to prevent HIV, mm-hmm. just saying. Mm-hmm. And I just think like it's this weird cultural thing that we've decided is okay. Nobody else, like I compare it. I'm like, well, if you just wanted to cut out, if you said, oh, and all new babies, we cut off the top part of their ear because Mm -hmm. it could get scratched, you know, and you'd be like, that's so stupid. But this is a, you know, I know it has religious connotations, but sometimes just because something is cultural doesn't mean it should continue to be carried forward. So yeah. And I, as a breastfeeding person, there's nothing that makes breastfeeding more difficult than a baby who's in pain and might already have breastfeeding Mm -hmm. issues. And then you're trying to learn Mm -hmm. how to breastfeed and the penis hurts like, ah, Mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, we use numbing medicine, but it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. not comfortable. So Welcome yeah, so I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and I, you know, I haven't talked a lot about it on my social media because I like don't have the strength. No, I get that with those activists. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I get, get because you know, I was like, I was yeah. kind of, I was like, yeah, I can't, but I, yeah, there, even for, if you want to join that community, it's really difficult to kind right. of feel like, oh, <laughs> right. Cause, the, cause then with own. the. their next sentence is, well, you aren't doing enough to bring that, that point of view out there. And I'm like, I know. And there's a reason too, because if I do, I'm opening myself up to a world of hurt, but here's how I do it. I don't do them. And I mm-hmm. counsel my patients about the, you know, again, yeah, I have to you, be balanced. Do you find conversations is good. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah. find that more and more parents are choosing not to? 
Yes. Yeah. And again, it's very depending where you are. So I'm in, you know, the hippy dippy capital of the world <laughs> or the United States, I feel like, which I kind of love because I feel like circumcision rates are so much lower here. Mm-hmm. Because of that, I think in certain traditional, you know, certain areas that's going to be higher worldwide, it's not that common. Don't quote me on the data, but I feel like the rates are going down because I think we're, we're understanding a bit more about what it means. And we, you know, as that consent culture becomes slowly catching up, it's like this baby didn't consent to this, you know? So when I have to counsel people, I'm like, so here's the procedure and here's the risks and the benefits. And I'm very honest. I'm like, you know, I have to say these benefits, but they're not they don't really justify a surgery, but at the same time, if you want it, I can refer you, but you know, yeah, oh, it's so tricky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really tricky. And we've, mm-hmm. it is far less common in other countries. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting how common it is yeah. here. We've talked yeah. about the Kellogg brothers on the podcast before, <laughs> if you're, if you're familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, I didn't even get to your part about the shame. So I've had people who've said, well, I don't want him to get made fun of by a right. girl. And my response is always, I wouldn't want my son to be with somebody who made fun of them because of that. So that's a great screening question that's, right there. Oh, like, great. if you laugh at me for this, then you don't want. And they're like, oh. great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I'm like, and also, if they're looking at you in their locker room, tell them to look up, like, look yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, you don't my need to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do yeah. imagine, like, with the other things that we've been talking about, women's breasts and also, mm-hmm. like, Oh, labia shame. Mm -hmm. I imagine that there's a part of that based on people watching pornography or your family. I bet there. Absolutely. I bet there is some shame associated with that. Maybe on both sides. I don't know. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Yeah. And I don't fault people for that. Like I, you know, and also if like in your family, you're like, well, this is what you do. And you know, then yeah, that just seems like that's what you would do. So I think it's just talking about it more, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that impact women's health one way or another? Circumcision, male circumcision, mm-hmm. or no, that's the thing. Like, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, you'll see, um, again, I think the data is out there that there's an increased risk that they could have HPV if they're uncircumcised. We have a fix for that. It's called the HPV vaccine. vaccination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Crazy, you know? So, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Actually, maybe that would get parents to vaccinate their boys more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. there's so much misinformation especially about yeah. the vaccine like and why is there misinformation because it's associated with sex and we don't like to think that our 11 year olds could have sex at some point yet i am so excited my 11 year old he has his well child check in a couple of weeks and i'm like get all the shots hpv yes but you know he's like what's it for i was like for warts and for cancer of the penis he's like i want that i want that vaccine yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know i was like sign us up Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. One of the best things about this podcast for us is all the amazing and insightful people we've met. Throughout each of our series, we've seen many common threads. That's why we created the Health It's Personal Inspiration Line to celebrate our unique perspectives and let others around us know that we get it too. We teamed up with artist Cloud Ramkey to help bring these common threads to life. We've all dealt with challenges in our lives that make us stronger. Hence, our new favorite saying, thanks for the trauma. We make sure to remind our listeners and friends that you're not alone and that it's always a judgment-free zone because that's where the best conversations start. Our designs are on t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, water bottles, coffee mugs, stickers, and so much more. These are great gifts for friends, loved ones, educators, caretakers, and advocates to help show your people that you care about their health and well-being. Head over to bonfire.com slash the hip podcast, our website, or our show notes for links to the merchandise and stay tuned for future inspirational designs and messages too. I think something I'd like to know if you have any advice is, you know, you're really open with your boys, obviously, and with your patients and you expressed how Mm -hmm. important it is to have those conversations to kind of inform people about their options. Do you have any advice on how couples or individuals can speak to their sexual partner about body image and kind of have those open doors of communication in that way. Yeah. Oh, it's so important because sometimes partners are not even trying to say something like, Oh, Mm. you know, you've gained weight or, Oh, I love your curves or, you know, I think it's just so important to set the stage for honesty and just be like, Hey, I don't like when you say that. And here's why. And just understanding the open communication that it's so key. And it's not about criticism. 
And to be honest and say, you know, when I was growing up and my mom said this about my hips, it really bothered me. And so when you say that, mm-hmm. you know, and your partner shouldn't argue, well, well I meant this. And yes, I know, but here's what I'm asking. So boundaries are good because they also give people a roadmap of what they can say and what you do like. Mm-hmm. I think it's why I do like talking about masturbation and that kind of thing, because when you feel confident in that area of your body, and then you can tell your partner, Hey, this feels good. You also feel empowered to say, this doesn't feel good. Or I don't like when you say this. And I just think it's just about, you know, it's like, if you drive somewhere, the more directions and descriptions you have, the better, you know, you'll get there in one piece. And so I think it's just about communication and not taking things personally and understanding that we're all learning and we all have different words that are okay. And parts of our body that are okay. And we're not all Jenna Jameson or other porn stars or like, you know, it's all about consent, which is not a one-time thing, right? It's continuous. It's adapted to the situation. It can be revoked. And and that's the same thing with saying, you know, I don't like when you grab me here or you say this about that, or you compare me to this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about honesty and feeling Mm -hmm. safe. And yeah. And if you're in a relationship where you're getting made fun of for those things, or, you know, then maybe you should reevaluate that. Maybe that's not good for you. And Easier said than done, right? When we're in a mm-hmm. culture like this or when we think we have to be partnered to be worth something. But mm, yeah. um, mm. but I'm hopeful. And I really feel like Gen Z, I mean, sometimes they're crazy, but they're, <laughs> yeah. they really get it because they call out the BS, yeah. right? Yeah. They're like, they're like, not going to tolerate that. <laughs> no, and I love it. Awesome. And that's why I'm like, oh my God, one day they're just going to take me down, but it's okay. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like they're, they speak up, they're calling out politicians, they're calling out people. Mm-hmm. And they have the platforms to do it. I think it's, yeah. it's great. So yeah. that's what uh, Kate and I, I think we both love that about our jobs and teaching mm-hmm. these college students who are, yeah, they're so passionate and fired up about the topics they're yeah. talking about. Yeah. And they, they contact me and they're like, so I'm doing this, this, and this, like, what would you advise? And it's like, when I was 17, I was so self-centered. I was not, yeah. You know, I was like, you're better than I am. You're, you're a great human. Keep going. Yeah. 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 You're doing a good Keep job. on keeping on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. And on the, I guess kind of a related note, you got me thinking about kind of body image again and body dysmorphia. And mm-hmm. that's a huge, speaking of social media and Ugh, yeah. even younger people, that's a really common topic. Like, oh, I had body dysmorphia today again. Yeah. I guess, do you have any advice for people going through that? Yeah. I just think it's so important. You know, I would say I'm not an expert in that, so I don't want to act like I've got, you know, the five-step treatment plan, but I think it's just super important to understand that we are in front of our screens for 145 minutes every day. The average American is on social media. So what you, it's just like the food that you eat, like what you put into your body. So what are you seeing? And if you're only following people who are like, perfect. And they're perfect because they've got 12 people helping them or a filter like that that messes you up. And, you know, we all do it. So really just being very mindful of like what you put in front of yourself because it's, it it's so toxic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that just reaching out and knowing that it's okay. And I also, you know, again, with Gen Z, they brought in the high-waisted pants and thank you because I feel like (laughs) Like, God, life has never been better for me since I adopted that trend. But just like, you know, understanding that you don't have to be like everybody else and that no you middle don't part, have to. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, really, guys? Like, that's what we're worried about? And I was like, I'm 40. I don't care. But I will. But I, of course, I got the high waisted pant like a year after it was cool. So I'm you know, very late to the game. But but to speak like body just more. What I love is that Gen Z is like, I don't care if this is, you know, covers everything up in a super baggy and whatever. I like how I feel in it. I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. do it, you know? But yeah, body dysmorphia is real. And social media, I don't know um, if you guys talk about this, but oh my God, I'm on social media and I will keep my kids off of it until the last possible moment mm-hmm. because it's so harmful, I think, to their mental health if it's not monitored and limited and, you know, they're allowed to just ingest all this crazy content. So yeah. Yeah. McKenna has been uh, thinking about that a lot for future children to mm-hmm. you know, want to go into that a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah. I know. I mean, my 11 year old's like, when can I get a phone? And I'm like, who are you calling? First of all, there's <laughs> yeah. nobody. He's like, I'll call you from school. I said, no, we're in school. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. I know. I was like, we just spent a whole year together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you know, my husband is much more adept at talking about this because he screens for social media use at all of his preteen and mm-hmm. teen visits. And it's crazy what kids are doing. And yeah. So I think delaying it as long as possible, having limits and having it not in private places. So, you know, you park your phones in the kitchen for the day and you don't bring them up to your room, but it's all about modeling. I, so I'm on social yeah. media a lot. <laughs> 
And I work very hard to not be on my phone in front of my kids because I don't want them to see me. Or if I am, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm writing back a work email. And trust me, I'm not right. perfect. We're all in this pandemic and it's all hell. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just watching, like I said, like dog TikToks because I need it. <laughs> but trying to be intentional and trying to tell my kids, like, there's a reason I don't let you go on YouTube. Well, you're there, mom. I was like, yeah, I'm there. I'm talking about masturbation and dildos. And you don't need that <laughs> quite yet. When you will, you will be a subscriber. But there's also a lot of garbage. So yeah. Cause once they, you know, they're only, once they're out there, it's hard to take it back. So mm-hmm. yeah, my, he's in the fifth grade and he's like, well, my friend has a phone and dun, dun, dun. I was like, so I don't care. And then I become my parent. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. if he jumped off a cliff, would you? And I was like, oh God, it happened. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, did I just yes. say that? Yeah. <laughs> I did. I was like, you were right. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask how you talk to your boys about masturbation? Yeah, no, I don't mind at all because it's come up very naturally, which is great because you find them finding themselves and I'm talking when they're young, you know? Yeah. And I just say, oh, does that feel good? And they're like, yeah, it does. And I'm like, I know, isn't it so cool our bodies feel good? And they're like, listen, so here's the thing, you know, bacteria can live down there. So I want you to wash your hands. It's totally fine if you want to do that. Just go up into your room. Just understand that's a private thing. And just, you know, wash your hands afterwards. And they're like, okay, like, mom, could I have a snack? Like it's you know, <laughs> coral, totally not a big deal. Um, if you wash your hands, I said, <laughs> <laughs> have you washed your hands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also um, the other thing that we talk about too, it starts, you know, when they're young, you know, the respect of a closed door and privacy. So knocking and, you know, I get it. If you want to be in your room, you know, and you knock and vice versa, you can just storm into the bathroom, which works 50% of the time when I'm in there, but whatever. <laughs> But just setting up these ideas of consent. I talked to other people about it starts when they're babies and you might feel really stupid talking to your six month old and say, I'm going to change your diaper now. Can I wipe? Again, you might think it's nuts, but they get it and they answer and they, they know. And then that becomes, that sets the stage for them when they're teenagers. Like you, you know, you always ask before you touch. Right. And, Mm. and I just think it's so cool when like an eight month old, like can respond to that and be like, it's just so cool. Mm. Yeah, so it, it probably makes a lifetime of difference. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of pushback to that too that we were just talking about recently. But we about think what? It's very cool about asking, oh, yeah, asking the, babies consent to change their diapers. Oh yeah, you know people are angry thing over everything. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. but again, people who are angry, I'm like, this is what you're angry about. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know. <laughs> Let me give you like, 20 other things that yeah. are right. really going to fire you <laughs> exactly. up. And they usually exactly. totally miss the point too. Like right. that's not. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Or like, you don't have to kiss grandma. Like I'm very clear. I'm like, mm-hmm. just say no. And if they say no and they don't respect you, like come to me because I will talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Or maybe even saying like, oh, we haven't seen grandma in a while. Do you want to go and give her a hug and a kiss? You know, like asking <laughs> Like check, yes. having them check in with how they're feeling toward grandma right now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 And little things like tickling, like the rule in the house, like if you say no, like stop, like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, cause just, tickling is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Tickling mm-hmm. can be really funny. And then it's really strange. And weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Agreed. My son went through a phase of that and I, it was such like the most awkward phase. Yeah. Cause he always wanted to like tickle everyone else, you know? Right. And I, it was like, I think it <laughs> he was, was like his old. way of like, connecting or whatever so yeah and when it's so hard to connect you're like okay well we got well let's do this right no I get it yeah I know parenting's so fun it's so fun and it's also fun to have all these things that you can then hold over their heads like (laughs) like I just can if they get married like I just have like the the slideshow in my head of like things that you've done in places and you know yeah remember when you you did break dancing yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) Yeah. Oh Remember when you were on the airplane and you yelled out, mommy, my penis is so big right now. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, like it is, it is. And <laughs> that's an inside thought when we're in public, oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> Well, that's like oh my, my, my little brother, he's eight years younger than me. So I was kind uh-huh. of like co-parenting and right, he, exactly. he was so excited when he got his first pubic hair and he just came out <laughs> of the bathroom and ex- in front of everyone yes. and he will never forget it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Those For stories. Sure. I mean, that's like, a, that's a toast right there. Right? Yeah. Like, this time. And now as you go off on your wedding night, let me remind you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Sorry. Well, we're so thankful for the work that you do and the fact that you're talking about these things online and places where people truly need it is the biggest blessing, uh, providing scientific and real information about things that 
historically have been really hard to talk about. And I think yeah. this will make such a big difference in future Aww. generations and relationships between parents and kids. So Aww. it's important. I know that's not maybe the most comfortable space for a professional to be because like you said, it can be kind of a awkward place to be, but it's important that you're there. So thank no, you. No, it's fun. And I don't have it all figured out, trust me, as a parent or as a provider. So I'm like learning again alongside, but it's just, I think it's just good to, you know, we all know better when we do better, we're all going to make mistakes. And it's mm-hmm. just, it can be funny and not that big a deal. And, you know, just talk about these things and normalize them. So I'm glad, to thank you for having me and for you guys doing this stuff. Cause yeah. Like, and thank the more you we talk your... about it, the more normal it'll be. Agreed. <laughs> and thank you to your husband too, because I've mm-hmm. been looking for a pediatrician for years that could just be that person and yeah. be someone comfortable to speak to for young people because they have a lot of questions. It's important that they're answered. Thank you. Oh, I'll tell them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes. So you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. It's a DR Jennifer Lincoln and the same on YouTube. And you, my website is drjenniferlincoln.com. You can like see a theme here. And then my book, let's talk about down there is on Amazon, but I also really love supporting local bookstores. So if you can shop there or ask them to carry it, they can usually get it for you pretty easily. Yeah. I'm all over those places, causing trouble, educating, having fun. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Health It's Personal. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts for bonus episodes and new releases every Wednesday. Please listen, subscribe, engage, and send us topics we can explore that would help you on your journey. Because health, it's personal.